Okay, we go ahead and start back up. So we just reviewed acid-base equilibrium and how to decide whether what's more acidic than the other. You write out the equilibrium, you identify the acids on both sides, you find their pKa values, and then the strongest acid wins or loses its proton. Uh, and so in this case, HCl is more acidic than H3O+, so we predict that equilibrium favors uh, the right side of the equation. Uh, there are some acids in between uh, hydronium and hydroxide, or, or rather hydronium and water, that it's good to be aware of. Um, one of the most important is the carboxylic acid. And by this we mean uh, a proton that's bonded to an oxygen where that oxygen's bonded to a carbon with another carbon on it. <laughs> this is a functional group called a carboxylic acid, which we'll encounter a lot in the future. You may have encountered these, I think, in Gen Chem. Acetic acid is a classic example. Uh, these have pKa's in the, in the sort of range of four or five. Uh, depending on what this R group is, the pKa value can change a lot, but this is sort of the default value. The conjugate base for acetic acid is this uh, negatively charged what we call a carboxylate anion. Okay, um, now you may ask why is the proton attached to uh, the carboxylic acid so much more acidic than the proton attached to water? After all, in the conjugate base, you both, you, they both have a negative charge on oxygen. And uh, this is where red, the concept of resonance becomes important because the negative charge on the oxygen for hydroxide is localized at a single location, whereas the negative charge on the carboxylate anion is actually resonance stabilized. It is in two different locations simultaneously. It's delocalized on both oxygens. So that resonance stabilization of the conjugate base lowers the penalty for having a negative charge. And this allows us to uh, state a principle that's general throughout organic chemistry. Molecules are acidic when they have stable conjugate bases. It's often easiest to rationalize acidity trends by comparing the stability of the conjugate base. So that's what we just did. I could have asked, why is acetic acid so much more acidic than water? And aside from the fact that acetic acid has acid in its name, whereas water doesn't, what's the principle? And the idea is if you compare the conjugate bases, the carboxylate anion has a resonance stabilized conjugate base where the negative charge can be on either of those two oxygens. Whereas the hydroxide, uh, the conjugate base of water, just has a localized negative charge on that oxygen. Okay, yeah? For carbonyl, the carbonyl carboxylic acid. Yeah. Um, Is it, the, is it a perfect example of resonance because... Uh, like, say the carbon on the left where it's H3, H3C. Yeah. Um, if that was something else, would it make a much greater difference? Like okay. Was, so, um, yeah, I think the question alludes to some other concepts we're going to see, which is how do we affect 
the acidity of molecules. Uh, there's multiple concepts that we're going to use to rationalize acidity and or stability of <coughs> conjugate bases. Resonance is one. Electronegativity is another. Uh, size of the atom that bears the negative charge in the conjugate base is another. It just so happens that um, here we're comparing apples to apples because the atom identity and electronegativity is the same, size is the same, resonance is the only difference. Okay. Yeah. So uh, an, a related issue might be if we take this molecule, which happens to be called phenol, its pKa is around 10, and if we draw the conjugate base, sorry, and I haven't, we haven't spent any time at all on the rules of resonance. Those are in the introductory study guide, but they're really important, and you should get really good at them. Um, what you can see in the conjugate base, which is the phenylate, anion, the negative charge on the oxygen can be delocalized into the benzene ring to generate resonance structures that look like this. And of course there are others. We can uh, move charge around the benzene ring in this fashion. And again, if this is looking confusing to you, please take the time to uh, review and learn how to do resonance structures. That's going to pay off greatly in this class. Um, you see here that because of resonance, we can delocalize that negative charge both on the oxygen and on these three carbons in the ring. Okay. Well, then tell me why phenol is so much less acidic than the carboxylic acid. Go ahead. So having a lot of resonant structures is good or bad? Well, it's, we're talking about chemistry. It's either good or bad. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Sorry. From a not from a moral or metaphysical concept, but like, is it is it favorable to have many resonant structures or? or uh... Okay. So let's 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 uh, get into that thought just a little bit. Um, do you remember? Uh, well, at the beginning we talked about how because of the. Uh, the kinetic energy term of the Hamiltonian, which involves the second derivative of the wave function with respect to space, um, that wave functions that are more spread out are lower in energy. Delocalization is favorable. Okay? Resonance is one mechanism of electron delocalization. And so delocalization, we will see, of electrons spreading them out in space allows the wave function to slope to change at a slower rate, and that leads to lower kinetic energy. So that's, that, uh, that tends to be favorable. Now, I think the concept that may, that may be mixed up is this idea that not all resonance structures are good and some are bad. Now, in, in Gen Chem, you probably learned that charge-separated resonance structures are... Bad. I think that may be the, the principle or the idea that you learned. Um, but bad is a relative term. Uh, when we say that a resonance structure is bad, what we mean is it may be a minor contributor to the overall structure of the molecule. But sometimes those resonance structures can give you a clue as to the reactivity of a molecule. Um, in this case, if you look at the conjugate base, we already have a negative charge. So uh, moving that negative charge around actually doesn't uh, create much of a penalty. And if you do the calculations for this molecule, what you see is that the negative charge is indeed held both on the oxygen and on each of these carbons. So in general, resonance delocalization 
is stabilizing. And in fact, for phenylate, there are more resonance structures than there are for acetate. So a question becomes, why? Go ahead. Why is one more stable than the other? Would it be because of like the inductive effect? Because the one above has a oxygen that could also stabilize it? OK. So it, does it have to do with what's called an inductive effect? Um, that's a concept we haven't talked about yet, but it's, it's one of these other things that can be used to spread out electron density. The inductive effect relates to having nearby groups that can pull electron density away. Um, and it does have to do with electronegativity. Let me ask this. Look at the atoms that have the negative charge in these resonance structures. Okay, Acetate versus phenylate. What do you notice? For acetate, they're all what? Okay, right. So in the resonant structures above, the negative charge is always on oxygen, which is relatively electronegative, whereas in the phenylate anion, they, they are on oxygen, but then the, all the resonance delocalization is on carbon. Carbon's less electronegative than oxygen, so the resonance stabilization that you get here shouldn't be as good as the resonance stabilization you get there because all these alternatives have negative charges on carbon. So we're using two concepts there, and in, and in explaining acidity trends, what you're going to look for is the difference between two things. So, you know, why is acetate more acidic than phenylate? The answer isn't simply resonance, and the answer is also not simply electronegativity. It is that in the resonance structures of phenylate, the negative charge is on carbons, uh, is, is on both carbon and oxygen, whereas in the acetate resonance structures, the negative charge is only on oxygens. And because oxygens are more electronegative than carbons, uh, acetate is therefore more stable than phenylate. Okay. Questions about that? That's kind of being able to, people get mixed up when trying to decide whether something's more or less acidic and um, explaining why. And you have to look for the key difference between the two. All right. What else? Go ahead. Um, why, do, why is like iodine more acidic? It's just one. Ah. Okay. So. Why is HI, we could ask, why is HI so much more acidic than, than water? Well, a hydroxide has a full octet too. Yeah, so, so let's actually do that. Let's compare iodide with OH minus. Um, okay. So, and, and that difference in acidity is huge. I mean, 16 versus minus 11, that's a factor of 10 to the 27 in equilibrium constant. So, that's maybe more atoms than are on the Earth total. Uh, and possibly more stars than are in the universe. <laughs> At least the universe that we can see. So, um, what's the difference? Well, if you look at, let's talk about stability of the conjugate base. If you go look up electronegativity values, I forget what it is for iodine, but it's extremely underwhelming. Iodine is about the same electronegativity as carbon. So actually, oxygen's more electronegative than iodine. So that can't be the explanation. Uh, and in fact, um, another thing that shows up with a pKa of about 4 is HF. And fluorine, of course, is the most electronegative element. So what's going on here? And that uh, you have to know something about uh, the periodic table and trends as you go from one row to the other. As you go down a column of the periodic table, size increases. Uh, this is because you continue to add valence electrons and each 
set is a little bit further out. The wave functions for, for electrons that are in, in lower rows of the periodic table actually spread out further from the nucleus. So if you look at the radius for iodide versus the radius for oxygen, oxygen's very small, iodide is comparatively large. Um, how can I illustrate that? Hmm. Let's go back to Spartan and let's see if it'll let me, it probably doesn't let me do negatively charged things, so I probably have to, there's water, and I wanna show, let's see, space filling. Okay, that's how big oxygen is. Take a mental picture. That's how big iodide is. So you have to just imagine that there's a difference between the two. I guess we should have taken, <laughs> taken screenshots. Um, so uh, if you compare like OH minus versus iodide instability, or perhaps a fairer comparison is within the same column of the periodic table. We could also make the comparison with fluorine. Um, iodide is large and oxygen is small and fluorine is even smaller. Okay, if a molecule, an, 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 if an atom that holds a negative charge is larger than another atom, the negative charge on iodide is more spread out than the negative charge on oxygen. And that plays a greater role than, uh, than in this, this comparison, uh, greater role than electronegativity. So iodide is not that electronegative. Oxygen is pretty good electronegative. And fluoride is crazy electronegative. So uh, you can't rationalize the acidity of, of HI versus HF, pKa of minus 11 here for HF, pKa of four. You can't rationalize that difference based on the electronegativity of the atom that holds the negative charge, but rather you have to rationalize it based on size. So if an atom and we're, and we're be careful because we're only talking about the atom that has the negative charge. People mix this one up all the time and say, oh, well, that molecule is huge, therefore uh, the thing must be acidic. No, it's about the atom that holds the negative charge. If the atom that holds the negative charge is bigger, that negative charge is going to be spread out over more space and therefore be lower in energy. Okay? Um, so that would justify why HI is so much more acidic than HF, and also why HI is so much more acidic than water. Okay. Does that make some sense? Good? Yeah. So like as a general rule, stability just determines the acidity of Boom. As a general rule, <laughs> stability of the conjugate base determines the acidity of the acid. Yep. More stronger acids have more stable conjugate bases. Um, okay, other yeah. questions? Yeah. If I'm looking at an acid base reaction, uh, will the strongest acid with the lowest pKa always be the one that loses its proton? The answer is yes. All right. So there's some other uh, bases that are, or, or rather other acid, acidic groups that are good to, to know, uh, especially in biochemistry and health related fields. Uh, one of these is something that 
may at this point be straight out of your nightmares. This is called imidazolium, and it is an example of a positively charged acid. It has a pKa of around 6, and its conjugate base is the neutral imidazole. Now, rationalizing stability of uh, positively charged acids versus their conjugate bases sometimes it works better by considering the stability of the acid. Let me show you how that is. This imidazolium ion has resonance structures in which I can put that positive charge on the other nitrogen. Okay, so that's resonance delocalization. Uh, I forgot where I was going with that. So it's true there is a resonance structure, but there's no relevant comparison. I'm sorry. Um, stay tuned. We may come back to that. This is a this is a side chain on proteins. This is the uh, if you've ever heard of histidine or histamine, this group is found in those molecules. Um, okay, another type of molecule would be uh, a th what's called a thiol. Uh, let's just put a CH three here. This is the sulfur version of an alcohol. Notice that sulfur's one row down from oxygen. Sulfur should be larger than oxygen. So go ahead and make a prediction. Is the thiol more or less acidic than an alcohol? The alcohol is, the corresponding alcohol would be like CH3OH. Think about the atom that holds the negative charge in the conjugate base, which is more acidic, the thiol or the alcohol. The thiol, because size, sulfur is bigger, therefore the negative charge is spread out, uh, and the pKa of that thiol is in fact around 8. Um, thiols are particularly smelly compounds. They used to be called mercaptans because they bind, the sulfur binds mercury pretty tightly. To this day, if you spill mercury, one of the solutions is to take some, some just powdered sulfur and spread it around wherever the mercury is, and you can, you can bind it up. Um, the thiol group is also a, a side chain for proteins. Uh, it's the cysteine side chain, and you'll learn more about that in 352. Um, okay. So on our tour through acids, we're now going to talk about the ammonium ions. And this is a source of never-ending confusion. And I, I guarantee some of you, well, I hate to do this, but some of you will likely be in my office after the exam uh, wondering why you got a problem wrong. And it will likely be because of this issue. Okay, just sort of throwing that out there. Common problem people struggle with. Um, ammonium ions are positively charged, have positively charged sp3 hybridized nitrogens. So this is uh, one ammonium ion, and they have pKa's that tend to be around 11. The conjugate base of an ammonium ion is an amine. The place where people get mixed up, well, there's multiple places where people get mixed up, but uh, people have a hard time understanding what I mean by R. Okay? R is a general uh, abbreviation, meaning that we could put a lot of different things here. 
but usually uh, R is assumed to be some kind of alkyl or hydrocarbon group like say methane or ethane or some other hydrocarbon. R generally doesn't include things like carbonyl groups uh, because that or anything that could change uh, the resonance stabilization situation. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, put an alkyl group here even though I want you to realize that this could be many other things but not a benzene ring and not a doubly bonded uh, oxygen. Okay, uh, there are, of course, we could replace any number of those hydrogens on the ammonium ion with an alkyl group. And that's not actually going to change the pKa that much. Now, sometimes I get lazy and I tire of drawing all of those things. So sometimes I might summarize that with R3N plus H. People get confused because they, uh, they'll see this in a pKa table and they will only apply this number to things that have nitrogens that have three carbons attached to them and that's not what we mean at all. Um, I will use the R here to be interchangeable between alkyl groups and hydrogens. So if you see on a pKa table this with a pKa of 11, I just mean ammonium ions tend to have pKa's that are around 11. That R could represent a hydrogen or an alkyl group. Um, yeah. Yes? And the reason it's R3, not R4, is because the H has to act as the R4. Right. The reason it's R3 but not R4 is because we have to have a proton to be the acid. Okay? The conjugate bases of the ammonium ions are amines. Okay? Um, amines have a nitrogen with a lone pair, and I don't know what I was doing there. That's kind of dumb. Sorry. Okay. Uh, people will call this a primary amine. I abbreviate that with one and a little circle. Primary amine, secondary amine, tertiary amine. has to do with how many alkyl groups you have on the amine. Similarly, we could call this a primary ammonium ion, a secondary ammonium ion, a tertiary ammonium ion. All right? Now, that's all, that's, that's a problem of using a pKa table and looking up the wrong number, and people do that all the time. The second problem is uh, related to getting mixed up with polyprotic acids. And you're really going to love this. Because, as you notice, the amines also have hydrogens on them. So we could come down here and say, OK, fine. What if the amine lost its proton to become an anion? What if I lose one of those protons? Of course, the tertiary amine no longer has a proton to be removed, so I get to cross that one off the list. What if I lose a proton to get... that molecule, which would have a negative formal charge on nitrogen, or 
this molecule, which would also have a negative formal charge on nitrogen. Do you see where I get from here to here? I've lost the orange proton. Okay. The pKa for this process, going from the neutral amine to the negatively charged amide anion, is 38. That is a hugely different number <laughs> than 11. Another factor of 10 to the 27 or something like that, right? So you can, if you get mixed up on uh, ammoniums versus neutral amines as acids, you're going to get problems wrong. Uh, as an example, um, I have put on exams before a problem related to this one. It's not exactly the same problem. But um, I have asked the question before, is hydroxide a strong enough base to remove a proton from this ammonium ion. And to do that, you simply draw the conjugate base of our acid on the right-hand side of the equilibrium, and you draw the conjugate acid of our base on the right-hand side of the equilibrium. Okay, acid, base. Now, of course, I memorized that the pKa of water is 16. But then I go to the table, and I get confused, and I write 38 here. Right? Then I conclude strongest acid wins, its pro wins, which means it loses its proton. And I tell you that this side dominates at equilibrium. But that's exactly the wrong conclusion because the number 38 applies to the neutral amine losing its proton to become negatively charged amide anion. Here we have positively charged ammonium cation losing a proton to become neutral amine. That pKa is not 38. Instead, it is 11. <clears throat> So, now who's the stronger acid? The ammonium ion has the lower pKa. It is the strongest acid. Equilibrium will favor products. So, OH minus is strong. OH minus is indeed a strong enough base to remove a proton from ammonium. Okay? Um, there's another context, another type of question in which... Um, this kind of issue shows up. And we just as well talk about it now. Um, the question is, let me see, there's more, there's more acids to add here, but this is a decent time to discuss this issue since we're on about ammoniums and amines. Uh, a related question is, suppose I have a protein or a biopolymer. And proteins have side chains, some of which are uh, acidic. So I'm going to draw this particular side chain. And we'll go ahead and put a few other functional groups on this protein. I'm not showing you what a protein is. You're just, you just have to accept that it's got functional groups on it. Um, all right, and I have asked before the question, pH is 7. We're in a dilute aqueous solution of this protein. We're controlling the pH with some buffer such that pH is constant and does not change when we dissolve this molecule in the solution. So what that means is the pH of the solution is going to determine the state of each of these side chains. Uh, and so I've asked before, what should be the total charge on this molecule at pH 7? Which is another way of asking which groups have protons on them. 
which groups do not. Let me put, just for fun, another functional group. Okay. How do you even make that decision? Um, based on pH, how do you predict whether the acid form or the base form of a particular acid should dominate? To do this, we are, we're actually going to go back to our expression for, P, for Ka for any given acid. And we have to be general here because this equation in, it deals with a neutral acid going to a negatively charged conjugate base, but it could just as easily have been a positively charged acid going to a neutral conjugate base. We're just being as general as we can, acid versus conjugate base. Uh, now, when we defined pKa, we took the minus log of Ka, but if we take the minus log of this expression over here, Uh, logarithms. Um, properties of logarithms. What do I do with products and quotients? If I take the log of a product, I can also take the sum of the individual logs. I can't prove that. You got to go look it up, and Wikipedia will tell you that that's true. Um, so we could actually pull out the minus log of H3O plus, and then we could leave the minus log of A minus over HA in the parentheses. But this term is just pH, right? Minus log of H3O plus is just pH. Ah, I'm hearing whispers. That's the henderson hassel equation. Yes, it is. And you used it previously, but not in the, not in the way we're going to use it. Or, or maybe you did. I don't know. But the, the most common use for that equation in general chemistry is apple pencil battery is low. 5% remaining. Okay. Well, that means we've got 20 minutes. That'll work. Um, you've used it previously to say, I have I want the pH of my buffer to be 7. How much acid versus its conjugate base, suppose, you know, phosphoric acid versus sodium phosphate, do I have to mix in order to hit that pH just right? Have you had problems like that before? You basically had to just use your calculator. Um, we're in a different situation here. In that situation, the concentration of your buffer and the, the amount of acid versus base form determines pH. In contrast, we're now adding a, a molecule to a buffered solution already. We're adding the molecule in a low enough concentration that it's not going to change the pH. The pH of the buffer determines the state of the molecule. Okay, So uh, what we can do for each of these groups is we can make the comparison between pKa and pH. And um, negatives sometimes are challenging to deal with, so we can use another property of logarithms and just take the reciprocal of what's in the parentheses. OK. This is now a highly useful form of the henderson hasselbalch equation because if we compare the pKa of an acid versus the pH of a solution, if whether that number is positive or negative should tell us whether the acid form dominates or the conjugate base form dominates. So what if we're in a situation where the pKa of our acid equals the pH? Then our equation becomes 0 equals the log of HA over A minus, or in other words, 1 equals the concentration of HA over A minus, or in other words, the concentration of HA equals the concentration of A minus. So if the pKa of your acid equals the pH of solution, you've got 50% acid form, 50% conjugate base form. All right. 
in contrast, what if pKa is greater than pH? Then we've got a positive number on this side of the equation, which should mean that HA, shoot, did I get it wrong? pKa is greater than pH. That means the proton is still on. HA dominates over A minus. Did I do that math right in my head? A logarithm of a number is positive when that number is greater than 1. Yeah. In contrast, if pKa is less than pH, that means I've got a negative number on the left-hand side of the equation so that A minus should dominate over HA. Okay. So um, you, you don't need to do the math or derive things. I mean, yay, we just der derove, derive, 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 I don't know. I've heard it both ways. Yeah. Psych fans out there, any? Yes, okay. Um, sorry. Uh, we've just derived this uh, Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. You don't need to be able to do that. But you do need to know this conclusion which is we're going to compare pKa to pH and that will tell us what, what form uh, acid form versus base form dominates. So let's, let's work through that for each of these groups that are in our protein. And again, we would need to look at the pKa table. Uh, the, the groups on the bottom are actually really easy. Carboxylic acid has a pKa of 4 for this proton. The thiol, you could look it up in a table, has a pKa of 8. You would not find the pKa of an alcohol in your table because you've memorized it, and it is minus 2 is for the protonated alcohol or hydronium. Yes, 16 is the other number. Now, what about this group? This is something people struggle with um, because they look at that group and they say, oh, that's a neutral amine. So I'm going to go to the table and find the neutral amine acting as an acid. That's, and that pKa is 38 for the neutral amine going to the amide anion. Okay? Uh, but they forget about the other equilibrium, which is pKa11. That's for the positively charged ammonium cation going to neutral amine. Uh, and I've drawn this molecule. You're right, you, might, you might ask, well, why didn't you just draw this as the ammonium ion? Well, um, because I want you to think about things. And also because probably this is the form you would, the neutral form you would buy in the bottle to dissolve an aqueous solution. Go ahead. Um, the way I kind of see it is that um, ammonium ions are typically uh, to the people. Uh -huh. So the amine has no lone pair in it with the neutral form. Uh, no, the amine, the, the regular amine is also... I think the words you used in Gen Chem might have been trigonal pyramidal. The lone pair is there, so that nitrogen is surrounded still by four groups, still going to be sp3 hybridized. You could call it tetrahedral, but with geometry, we only count the atoms, not the lone pairs, so that's why it's trigonal pyramidal. But if you think about it as sp3 hybridized, that's just fine. Yeah? Question? No? Is that a stretch in the back? No? Okay. Can we just figure it out just by knowing the charge, like it's positive? Yes, I mean, if it's positive, it's, you're dealing with the ammonium. If it's neutral, the amine. Negatively charged is the amide anion. The problem is most people see this neutral amine, and I'm telling you, you're putting this molecule that's neutral in pH 7 solution, and it's going to become charged. They forget about the equilibrium between neutral amine and positively charged ammonium. Right? Let me just say that again, because I'm going to have this conversation with some of you after the exam, and you're going to say, well, I thought, some of you are going to say, I just want you to hear my thought process, because you're, you're hopeful that if I hear your thought process, I will give you points, right? 
Um, and I will say, I don't care what your thought process was. Your answer is wrong. I'm sorry, I don't say that, and I often award partial credit. But if you can avoid the situation anyway, then let's just do it. Um, you will tell me my thought process was that the pKa for the neutral amine going to the negatively charged amide is 38. Therefore, at pH 7, I should not have any of the, new, of the negatively charged amide anion, and I will tell you that is true. At pH 7, there is no negatively charged amide anion, but I will have to remind you that the amine also has another protonation state, the positively charged ammonium, right? And at pH 7, which form should dominate? If we're dealing with, if we go back to our equation and we say pH is 7, pKa of positively charged ammonium is 11, so 11 minus 7 equals 4 equals the log of positively charged ammonium ion versus neutral amine. What does that tell us? What form dominates? The ammonium, right? So actually, at pH 7, the positively charged ammonium form dominates. And that group is going to have a positive charge. Where did that proton come from? It wasn't there in the beginning. Where did it come from? It came from the H3O plus that's, that's constant uh, uh, in solution at a concentration of 10 to the minus 7. Okay? All right. So don't let this happen to you. I, I don't know how to say it any more directly. But I am, but be scared of nitrogen. I don't know. I I just am. Um, I feel bad having this discussion with people after the fact in my office when we could have had it ahead of time and saved you some points, and in my evil self-interest, saved myself some time. Right. So uh, don't do that. Right. In a problem where I tell you we're dissolving this molecule in dilute aqueous solution, and you look at the nitrogen and it's neutral. Don't forget to consider the ammonium form. Because actually, unless the pH is higher than 11, the ammonium form is going to dominate. Why is that important? Whether or not a group is positively charged actually matters a lot in biology. You won't get to it this semester, but uh, when you take 352, it may come up. When you take biochem, it certainly will. All right, so uh, remember that there are I cannot tell you all the ways whereby you may commit errors on the exam. Um, so what is the phrase? Remember, oh humans, and be careful or something like that. All right, see you next time. <laughs>